Excellent. Yeah, I think the it's uh, JavaScript. I think um, any language is like this. The more you develop software in it, and that's whether you're you're following just the step by steps of the lab, or especially when you're having to start solving your own type of problems in it, the more comfortable you get with those languages. And so, fortunately, I think a lot of the syntax that we've learned for Java carries over with us. Uh, with JavaScript and the syntax that's different uh, makes sense. It's it's not so foreign as to not be able to map kind of an understanding of how to do um, something in JavaScript. Actually, uh, for those of you who've already learned a, a different programming language, you might already have realized this, but for those of you who this might be your, uh, your next second language that you're learning, You'll, you should realize that uh, learning new programming languages is a much easier task than learning new uh, natural languages or spoken languages, simply because a lot of the basis around programming languages are pretty similar. So they, they all revolve around having to define some set of control structures and storage operations to be able to store data and process on it. And so once you learn the nuances of that in a, in a programming language, you can start solving problems, start building applications with it. Excellent. So uh, for today's lecture, I want to finish off what we started last lecture. And let me get my chat room. Let me get everything set up here as chat room is there. Let me minimize so I can increase the chat room, minimize the participants. Perfect. I'm going to hop on over here and reduce this size so I can still see everyone making comments to me. Okay, so my intent for today's lecture is to finish off uh, the, the concepts that drives the document object model. So one of the key things that we need to understand that it will behoove you to have a strong grasp of when it comes to front-end development is not only HTML, it's not only CSS, and how styling works. It's not only uh, JavaScript, which is going to be the programmatical uh, uh, code. It's the it's a programmable logic that we have inside the browser. In fact, front end browsers only support one programming language, and that's JavaScript, which is one reason why we selected that language for this course, and also another reason why so many jobs are looking for people who have JavaScript experience. But uh, in addition to that. When we start talking about how to use JavaScript as a domain specific language, so what is its use case for browser applications, then it's pretty critical that we understand the document object model. And the reason why is the document object model is the select or specialized objects and methods and data that is available within the browser that allows us to update the content that's in the browser's viewport. It allows us to modify or add or delete HTML elements as they exist in memory to the browser. So when the browser first opens up an HTML document, it parses the contents, it reads it and creates an in-memory version and JavaScript gives us access to that in-memory version and mutate it so that we can change the state from what the HTML document originally looked like. So we covered a lot of this last semester, uh, last lecture. So we last left off here on step seven. So I believe I already made the video with steps one through five and I decided to skip six. I don't think it was so necessary. So today I wanna, I wanna finish off seven and uh, through 11 and hopefully start on um, the event loop, the event system in the browser and how we can do event handling which you've already had a primer on if you've started on the labs. So a lot of times these two concepts are sandwiched together, uh, the document object model, and then using them to set up events and uh, event handlers so that we can do fun and interesting things between the viewport and our JavaScript runtime environment. Okay, so let's go down here. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so this is where we last left off, the modifying the document. So DOM modification is the key for really creating interactive pages 
we saw actually that how we can modify the DOM by actually accessing pre-existing elements in the in our document and being able to mutate the inner HTML attribute that'll actually re-render new content. But the document object model, the DOM actually supports um, method calls to actually create new nodes to go ahead and insert into our HTML tree or the ability to remove nodes from our HTML tree or the ability, and when, when we go to insert, it gives us all sorts of options on where and how we can insert them. So we're going to look at some of the built-in mechanisms that doesn't just rely on inner HTML, which is what the lab predominantly uses, but we're going to look at just uh, some additional ways that we can go ahead and access that using the DOM. So let's let's take a look at this. So um, let's start by looking at code that's just HTML and CSS. So here I have a style um, tag. And so we're going to uh, define on a alert class uh, some padding, a border, a border radius, a color, and a background color. And so here, typically, if I went ahead and uh, defined this div with this class name alert and then embedded some, uh, some other text in there, it should go ahead and style that. So we've seen this lots of lots of times before. In fact, let's go ahead and take a look at this. So now that we're doing DOM stuff, I'm gonna start, gonna hop over here. I have an about blank. So this is just an empty page. If I look at the element, right? No head, no body. So here, let's see here. I'm going to access my console. I'm just gonna do document dot right? So just like they have a console.log, I don't know if I'm gonna cover this in the slides because this is a really archaic way to write to your viewport. But just like there's a console.log, we can actually write directly to our document uh, from the document object. So I'm just going to pass that code, right, this code from my slide right into there. So I'm going to define this style. I'm going to define this div tag that has the class alert. We'll just pass that, and you see I'll write that content right to the uh, HTML. Okay, so I'm just going to do this for testing purposes so I can kind of create interactive code examples to explain what's going on so we're not just looking at static slides. And so actually here, if I look, you see it actually modifies the in-memory uh, contents of my about blank page. So I do have that div tag and I do have that style. Okay, so yeah, if you want to do any debugging or test any of the slide code on your own, this is a good way to do it. I think this is what I'm going to start doing moving forward. Okay, so as you can see, the results of that is going to give me this. Okay, so what if I wanted to add that to my HTML page programmatically from JavaScript exclusively and not having to import it from an HTML document? So let's take a look at this. Ah, uh, no. No. Yes. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create an HTML document. So we can create an HTML document just like this. So from the document object, it has, there's the method create element, and then we can pass it the tag type we want to create. And that'll actually return back a JavaScript object of that type. So let's copy this code and actually do that right in here. So we'll go back over here. We'll do this. And so now if I type in div there, yeah, you see, I created a div element and it's now stored in memory. And so now it's just an empty div element. So if I want to go ahead and create a text node with an, I can go ahead and do that. So here from the document, I'll create a text. And remember there's, there's uh, several, I think there's 12 different nodes that can exist in the HTML tree. We really only care about three of them. We care about the, uh, the HTML element or the tag nodes. We care about the text nodes that can represent just text that is not tagged. And there's also the comment nodes. We will likely never touch those in this class, but just know that, that is a thing. Okay, so we'll create text node and we'll take a look at this and bam, there we go. We have a text node. Okay. And so here, so let's actually copy this. Okay, so if we want to create that message that we saw before, how might we do that? Well, number one, we create that div element. So let's say we have this div that 
We invoke on the document object the ability to create an element and we'll pass it the tag name we want. Then we're going to assign a class name. So there is an attribute class name. And then we can give it that, that value. So let's try that. So I think we already made this div. So let's put that there. And so here we'll do this like we were doing earlier with the guest game. We'll actually access the inner HTML attribute of our div and actually just go ahead and set this uh, HTML string that'll have that strong tag. So it says hi there and you read an important message. And so here, let's go ahead and do that. So now if I inspect div, we can see, yeah, there we go. We've created a div tag in memory in our JavaScript runtime environment. It has a class with alert and then it has this inner HTML associated with it. This seems easy enough. Okay. so. So far, we've done this just in the JavaScript runtime environment. It doesn't show up. As you notice, it hasn't showed up in our viewport yet because we haven't added it. We haven't inserted it into our HTML tree. So let's talk about insertion methods. Let's talk about how we can actually take these HTML nodes that we generate inside of our JavaScript runtime environment and add them in. Well, there is an append. So one way we can do this is there's an append method. So we can, we can tell any HTML element that we have access to in memory and go ahead and append this new node onto it. So let's say we want to do the document. So let me jump over here. Um, let's see if I clear this and still maintain. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's go to the document and let's go to the body and let's say, okay, body, let's append uh, that div. And here you'll see, right, once I do that in my viewport, I've just appended the HTML node as part of the HTML tree. So now it will render. So it's that easy to be able to add things exclusively via JavaScript into our viewport. So it's part of the HTML element. So if I, again, if I go into the elements here as well, you'll see that I have two divs now that look identical. Excellent. Okay, so let's move on from uh, just simply being able to insert because there's a number of ways we can insert. So, so far, we just looked at a pin. And so when we pass a pin, we can either pass it in a node, that's what we just did, or actually a collection of nodes. So notice it'll destructure your collection and uh, allow you to append multiple things, or you can pass it a string. So you actually have two different options for any of the insertion methods. Uh, other ways we can insert though, could also be to prepend in front of the node. We can also do before, after, or just replace a node with some other node. So let's look at the difference between append, prepend, before, and after, because those might seem very similar to one another. So again, let's go ahead and do this. Try to nope. Try to um, so refresh here. Okay, so here we start with nothing, and then I'm going to just do document dot write, and then I'll talk about what we're writing. So right here, I'm just going to write. Uh, let me go into my elements so we can see. So this is just an unordered, I uh, ordered list. I'm sorry, ordered list with an ID of ol, and I have a list item with uh, zero, one, and two. So here you can see ordered list. Zero, one, two. Perfect. Simple enough. Okay, so now that I have this HTML that's written into my viewport, let's try to insert things around it. So, oh, this is, um, I didn't show this before. I'm going to show this for testing purposes, but for your code, I don't want you to do this. Okay, so this is one of those things that for brevity's sake, I will take advantage of, and maybe it's good for you to know, but I'll, uh, it could be quite a pitfall if you rely on this on your own code. So whenever I give an ID to any HTML element, it automatically gets imported as a variable in JavaScript as a JavaScript object without having to import it manually. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, I created a ordered list here with an ID of OL. So if I just type in OL now, I should be able to access that ordered list without having to do get element by ID. So in the lab, you might've noticed we did a lot of get element by ID. Technically, 
that could have been um that th that could have been avoided. However, it is better practice when you're creating production level code, when you're creating code that's not just being shown off for fun little experiments like this, to use get element by ID. And the reason why is that if I were to create a variable right now called OL, I would overwrite my access to this this element, uh, to this HTML element with that new variable. And so it is a better security practice to go ahead and always query for your uh, HTML object before trying to access and mutate it or get information from it, as opposed to relying that there's not going to be a name conflict for your HTML ID versus your JavaScript name. But I just want you to know there's no magic here that I'm about to show. Once I give an ID to something in, uh, in uh, my HTML document, that ID is actually visible in the JavaScript runtime uh, environment as that, uh, as that label. OK, so let's go ahead and try to see what happens if we invoke the before method, the insert method before. So on our ordered list, we're going to pass a string before. And notice it's going to go right before the, um, our uh, ordered list. Let's do the same thing with after. There we go. And so let's take a look at our elements here. We could actually see we have before the OL element and after the OL element. OK, that seems nice. Seems pretty straightforward. OK, next thing we're going to do is actually I'm going to do this. Uh... OK, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to tell our document object to create an element and we want to create a list item element and we're just going to save that into a variable and then we're going to update the inner html of our list item to have the value of prepent so now i have a list item that will be first here we see it's in in uh, our javascript runtime environment so now we're going to invoke an insertion method suppose that we want to prepend that list item as the first element within the ordered list so this is what prepend is used for so notice inside of prepend, prepend is going to insert this HTML element into the ordered list. So it's a child of, and it's going to make it the first child of. So before and after actually insert it, this text before and after, so it's essentially at a sibling level, before the actual ordered list uh, element or after the ordered list element, whereas prepend and append insert as children elements into the uh, the HTML element that we're inserting into. So here's an example of our prepend and actually we'll do the same thing just as a proof of concept for our pen. So we'll, again we're going to create a so here we're going to create a from our document a new element HTML element and we're going to pass in a list item. And so we'll save that into a variable. We'll update the inner HTML to say append, and then we will append into our ordered list at the, the as the last item. And as you can see, it appeared right there. And so these are all the different types of insertion methods we have, and you can kind of see uh, all the behaviors, whether you want to give it ahead or um, behind as a sibling or uh, uh, the first or last of the child on an element. So lots of options. Okay. Let's see here. We also have uh, the insert adjacent HTML or text or, or element. So for inserting HTML for, via JavaScript, we have an element where on any element you can invoke um, um, this method here. So again, you, you can do before begin, after begin, before end, and after end. Let me see if I just have an example of this. Yep. I think these are the same slide. Delete one of those. Okay. So let's, let's test this out. 
let's refresh this page. Let's go ahead and for our document, write our initial HTML. Okay, so here I'm just gonna create a div tag. It's gonna have the ID of div and it's going to have the text of here. So I'm gonna do that. Yep, there it is here. If I look at my HTML, yep, there's a div, it has an ID. And that means that if I type in div here, because I gave an ID, I actually have access to this HTML div element. Okay, perfect. So let's see what happens if I invoke these methods. So I can also insert using insert adjacent HTML. I can give it a descriptor of where it's supposed to be inserted at. And then I can give it, um, say for instance, either HTML string or some other node on what I'm going to insert. So if I do this before, you see I have my hello. If I go to my elements, you can see this paragraph is going to be right before. So just like I had the, um, the ability to append with uh, before and after, I can actually just use insert adjacent HTML. It's just an alternate way to do the same kind of thing. And you could see I could do the same thing as the after method. And there it is, by, and if I inspect, I see before, I mean, uh, hello and by right in between my original div tag. Excellent. Okay, I can also remove nodes. Uh, so let's actually go over here. Uh, so I could just call remove. So do I still have access to that div? I do. So let's do div.remove and look at my here, right here. Look at my here. It's there one moment and now it's gone. So I can remove nodes from my HTML tree. I can insert nodes into my HTML tree. I have a lot of control on insertions. And then removes are pretty simple. You just have to have access to one you want to remove and uh, tell it to remove itself. Uh, we don't necessarily have to remove. OK, so when we go to swap things, uh, we don't necessarily have to remove them like you would in Java. So when we uh, take the reference of one HTML element and tell it to insert itself after another HTML element, the HTML document will actually um, change the reference of that node. So let me give you an actual, actual example so you can understand this a little bit easier. Let's clear out this and let's get our initial HTML. So let's do, nope, not window. Let's do document dot uh, write. And again, let's uh, insert initially these two divs. Okay, so I have these two divs, a first and a second div. Let me hop on up here. So I have a div with an ID first and a div with an ID second. And that's first and second, respectively. Okay, so that imagine that's my state of my uh, original HTML. And so if I do first, I have my first here. If I do second, I have my second there. Perfect. I have access to them in my JavaScript runtime environment. Okay, so let me show you what happens if we actually use an insertion method from one HTML element that already exists inside of our document to another. So when we insert, it'll actually change the reference and effectively remove the positioning of it. So watch watch the contents of my viewport when I go to hit enter. You're going to see it's going to go from first to second to second to first. And there it goes. See, so we could do these swaps very, very nicely without having to manage what's what's being removed or whatnot. See, so this allows us to put second after first. Obviously, this is really great if for any reason you have to sort tables huge, huge uh, reason, one of the main motivating reasons for JavaScript to begin with is being able to sort tables of data based off of certain parameters. Like for instance, if you wanted to see a collection of um, inventory based off of quantity versus price or alpha, you know, al having it alphabetized or whatnot. Okay, we also have, so we've, we've shown how we can go ahead and modify the uh, document by uh, creating new HTML nodes and how we can insert those nodes into our uh, HTML tree and how we can also remove things from the HTML tree. And the insertion also allows us to do swapping 
let's talk about cloning. So sometimes when you get some really complex, um, some, let me do this here. Sometimes when you get some really complex uh, um, HTML elements, ones that have multiple children or have multiple attributes assigned, it would be uh, it, it it wouldn't be very feasible to uh, generate each set of nodes and then all of its children and append all the children to the parent nodes. I mean, you could do it, but it would be a lot of work. But if you already have kind of like a uh, um, a template HTML element and you want to just be able to copy or clone it and mutate it with the new state, a lot of times that could save you a lot of work. And so we have the ability on any element to tell to clone that node. And the one parameter that a clone node has is a Boolean value of true or false. So if you put clone node true, it'll produce a deep copy clone, a deep clone. So it'll go ahead and copy all of the uh, attributes and all of the sub elements. If you select to clone a node, but pass it false, then the clone is made without any of the child elements, it just as the, the parent node, the node itself. So let's take an example of this again. So let's go over here and I will refresh, do the same thing. And then I'll initialize my state of HTML. So do a document write, and then I'll pass a string of all my HTML. So here I just have a style tag that'll get embedded into the head. I have a div tag that you get embedded into the body. Let's go ahead and yep, I have the high there. You, you've read an important message. Let's take a look at the HTML. Yep, I have a style inside the head with that alert style. And then I have this body that has the div, it has a class name, it has an ID, uh, and it has some text in there. So, and again, since I give it ID, I should have access to it right here. Yep, there it is. Okay, so suppose I want to be able to clone this, but mutate it with maybe a different message. Super easy. Let's just do this. So let's start with this. Uh, I'll just grab it all right now, then talk about what what it's going to do. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do here is I will reference my div, and since I give an ID, I could do that uh, right, the, right out the gates, especially since I don't have any of the variable, other variable named div. And I will tell it to clone the node, and I will say, tr I want this to be true, a deep copy. And I will save this into a new variable called div2. Then on div2, I'm going to do a query selector, which remember from last lecture, allows me to search my uh, DOM tree for anything that has the tag strong. So I'm just using a class selector here. And I'm gonna dereference that element as a JavaScript object, and I will access its inner HTML attribute, and I will change the inner HTML. So instead of saying hi there, it will say bye there. And again, notice how I can use this query selector uh, on an element itself. So every element itself is a, tr is a tree, right? So these tree traversals can be done not on just the entire uh, document object starting from the HTML node, but we can actually call these, uh, these query selectors on just elements themselves, which can have, which will be the root element and then all of its children, I can then uh, uh, essentially iterate and search on. So that's essentially what I'm doing here. Uh, and so I should find that strong right here, this, which has the text high there. So I'll change that to by there. And then afterwards, I will then tell the div element, which I have access to via its ID, and I will insert my div two. So it actually appears in my viewport after my div one. So when I go ahead, enter there, and there we go, we see we do go ahead, insert this new div after my previous div, but I have updated it but with a minimal amount of work, I was able to generate that new uh, node. So again, I just wanna highlight that there's a lot of functionality for being able to mutate our document object model, a lot of method calls, but they're really easy to use. Uh, it's just a matter of, of, um, of seeing them actually in practice and playing around with them. Okay, so we're done with talking about how we can modify a document uh, from the DOM. So let's move on to how can we mutate the styles of the, uh, or like the CSS of our, uh, of what's being displayed in the viewport using the document object model. So 
So there's generally two ways that we can style an element. We can either create a class in CSS and add it. So we can create a class here and give a class to our HTML element, or we can access the HTML element directly and, uh, and affect its style attribute. So these are the two approaches that we're going to examine. We can either access the style attribute as like an inline attribute as a property of the HTML element itself, or we can add a class to our HTML element and then define a class text to the CSS. So as you might have uh, um, uh, guessed, it would be preferable to do this via CSS classes as opposed to just mutating the style. However, there are often times where you might want to use the style approach. And I'm going to give you an example right here. So one example where actually it might be better to use a style approach as opposed to using the class name and then uh, uh, updating class text is on those instances where you need to compute a coordinate for your HTML element. Those coordinates are more readily available by just accessing them straight from the style property and then accessing either the left or the top or whatever the actual element is. So this is just an example of why it's important to know that you can access the style data. This would be too hard to try to compute via some kind of class-based approach. Okay, so let's talk about actually the class-based approach because that's the more generalized case on how we're going to affect styles from the document object model. So to change a class, uh, typically you would want to change the class attribute. But we have a problem because in JavaScript, class is a reserved word. Thus, you cannot be, it cannot be used in an object property like element.class. Like, obviously, that's clearly a violation uh, in terms of having an identifier rules because we classes used to define new classes. So with that said, that means in JavaScript, our class property is actually called class name. So whenever you see class name in the JavaScript HTML object, what that refers to is the class attribute in HTML. Most of the time, uh, the properties are the same when possible, but sometimes you'll have these small deviations, and this is an important one to, to be familiar with. Okay, so let's, let's play around with this, actually. Let's copy this code. So here I have some code that's just the body. I'll give it a class of main and a class of page. Um, or, uh, and then what I'll do here is I will then tell it to give me the class name. So we'll, we'll just call an alert right inside here. And in fact, uh, yeah, that's fine. So let me go here. Let me go to my uh, document. Let's set this up. I don't want to do this all in one. I want to... I'm going to be able to do this piecemeal. So let's just do this body here. And so I have a string here. So let me put that body. And let me close that body out. OK, so all my body, I'm going to give the class main page. OK, so now if I go here, my body should have the class main page. Perfect. OK, so now let's do this alert. Let's go ahead and send out an alert. Or I don't even need the alert. I can just do this document dot body dot class oh, it's, it's cheating okay so i could do class name and it will give me the entire string that's part of the class name but notice it wanted to fill this in for me too i could also do class name where what it's doing for class i mean i'm a class list and for class list it'll actually delimit using spaces and give you a list of all the individual classes so remember in Java and HTML, you can give multiple class names by just putting a space between them. So if we want to get the, the actual string, the string reference that was given in HTML, we can use class name. If we want to have access to each individual class, then we could do class list. And so that, I think I made a note here. Typically, we wouldn't use class list if we want to add or remove classes, because if you overwrite class name, it'll get rid of the entire string of all classes. So suppose, for instance, let, let, let's do this. Let's say document.body.class. Dot dot 
class name, right? And I'm like, oh, I want to give the class name of hello or who. It's always a favorite of mine. But now what I did by doing that is all I have is foo. So I got rid of main and page when I did that. And if I look at my class list, yeah, I only have foo. So if I wanted to add something, it's better for me to go ahead. Well, I, I could have done one, a couple of things. Uh, I could, I guess, concatenate like that. So I can get my, uh, my main and uh, page. Oh, but uh, that didn't quite concatenate how I wanted. So now I have a foo main. The easier way, the better way would be to just mutate your contents of your list. Because this gives you all the power of accessing things inside of an array to be able to insert or remove. And here, yeah, you can see all from class list, they have add, they have remove, and they even have contains. And you also have the ability to toggle, which adds the class if it doesn't exist, otherwise it removes it. So, so let's see, class list dot toggle. And let's toggle that foo main. Okay, so now you see that's been removed. Toggle it again. It's been added back in. So class list gives me much stronger controls to be able to add, remove, toggle, or check to see if an element contains a class name. Excellent. And here I can just go ahead and uh, iterate over a class. It is iterable. So I can go through uh, each of the elements like any other uh, array and be able to then just print out the value of those classes. So again, it's a collection. So just like HTML collection, just like node list, these are things that I can iterate through and, and be able to have my JavaScript make decisions on. OK, so one important to note is that as uh, as you may recall in HTML and CSS, it's pretty typical that multi-worded properties are separated with a dash, uh, which is fine because you don't do computations typically in uh, CSS or HTML. But the dash is used, uh, you know, is a special symbol in JavaScript. So we use Camelback notation inside of our Java JavaScript property names for CSS, uh, for the CSS properties. So for instance, background color, where the background, the color is typically separated by dash, we would use background color in Camelback notation to access that property. Now, but let's just, let's clear my console. This is document.body.style. Oh, I can see all my styles here. And actually you can see if I just inspect how the naming works on everything. So you can always, if you had to question anything and you were coding this in, in GS, you just open up your uh, your dev tools and see what the appropriate name for all the CSS properties are from the style object. Oh, here, let's do this fun one. This will be a fun one. We'll just set, we'll just set the background color to green. There we go. But you can see how I can just go ahead and update the style right from my JavaScript. So this could be really useful. Like, let's say, for instance, on your portfolio page, you want to have like a uh, well, you don't need. Uh, you want to do some kind of animation or you want to do some kind of transition based off of some criteria. You could easily be able to, to do that by accessing your CSS styles. Okay, let's see here. You can also reset a, a, a style. So let's let me show you how we can do that. You reset it by just uh, by setting it to the value of like a empty string. So let's say, for instance, we want to go to our display. Okay, so suppose we, we go into our document inside of our body element, the style on our body element, and the display property of style. And we set that to none. As you might recall, when you set that to none, it hides, right? It hides the entire element. So now my body's hidden, so it goes white. And so now if I go ahead and
set that to the empty string, it'll go ahead and reset it back. Okay. Okay, and uh, an another big thing is if we want to do a full rewrite of our CSS text and have multiple properties all at once, we can define a string that contains all the properties and we can't actually write that to style itself. Because remember, style is not a string. Style is a object. It's a CSS object property of an HTML node. So there's actually an attribute, a property called CSS, CSS text, which represents the text inside of a style object. Just, and we can actually overwrite all the properties of the CSS text using that attribute. So let's take a look at this. Let's, let's go over here. Let's do a refresh. Let's go document.write. Okay, let's write out this. So here I'm just going to create a div that has a button or that says button. It's not really a button, it's a div. And I will uh, give it the ID of div. So let's do that. Let's check the elements. Yep, I have a div. The text says button. Yep. Uh, since I gave an ID, I can access it right in my uh, JavaScript runtime environment. Can everyone hear me over the uh, lawn person who's next door? Okay. Uh. Okay, so let's go copy this. Okay, so inside of this div element that I have access to now, I will access the style object. And inside the style object is the CSS text property. And I will overwrite that to have the color red, the background color of yellow, the width of 100 pixels, and to text align as center. And look at when I hit enter here. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving a big piece of text that has four different properties defined. Watch what happens to my div here as I update that. And surely enough, all of those styles instantly go ahead and uh, get updated. So that is a reset of the default styles. Or if I had other styles that were part of that uh, the CSS there, I would have overridden them with these new set of properties. So here, so resetting, yeah, okay. So that's a, a good way to be able to set multiple properties all at once without having to do them line by line by line. Okay, so modifying a style to an HTML element is super easy, but what if you want to read it? I, it might seem like you can just go ahead and do body like document.body.style.color and, uh, and margin top, right? Like this seems like, this might seem like the way to go, but I want to illustrate this. So let's, um, okay. Let's get this style. So I'm gonna grab the style tab. Let's, let's write this into this so I can talk about what's happening while we're actually seeing this code in practice. Okay, so here we're going to add the style tag into an empty HTML document. So if I go here, I inspect my head, I have the style tag. So here I have a um, the element selector of uh, or tag selector of body. And so the body will have the color red and a margin of five pixels. Okay, so suppose I wanted to see these properties defined in the CSS. One of the you might think I should be able to access it like this, right? So it seems like this should be a thing, being able to access from the document my body element, its style object, and say, hey, what's your color property? But look at this. I, I, get, I don't get anything from that. I can't read the property of style. And so I'm going to get the same thing if I try to, to, to do uh, if I try to do a, a reach on margin top as well. 
So we can't read anything from the CSS class using the style object. So we need to use a method called get computed style to be able to get that. And so here I can just do um, get computed style and then I can pass it the bottom. So, and that'll actually return to me the computed style, uh, computed style object. So let's take a look at this. So here I have get computed style. And notice I'm not calling that on the document. That's actually being uh, called on the, the browser object model or the window or global window object. So we can get the computed style and then we can pass it a reference to an HTML node and it will return back an object. Is it, is it not in, let me see, is it part of document? That would look in there. Get element, get element, get computed style. Uh, okay, let's see here. Get computed style. Pretty sure that this was part of. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do a caveat on this. Fine. Okay. Let's find out where my get computed style is. It's up on my slides. It is inside the window. That's what I thought. Get computed style. Okay. What did I do wrong here? Window dot get computed. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Document dot body. And uh, do I need a? Now I should be able to just pass it in an element. It seems right. Oh, you know what? Ha ha! You know what happened? Uh, it's not my slide. It's my approach of showing you what's happening. I don't have a body. On my HTML, I just created a style. Okay, let's 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 uh, let's. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to my right here. Uh, okay, so I when I wrote my uh, HTML, I didn't give this a body tag, and so there's no body. My body reference was null, and so that was breaking that method call. Okay, so now let's go back over here, and now I have a body. Perfect. And I have a head for the style. So now if I do document.body, uh, I'm actually getting a body tag. I'm no longer getting null. Perfect. Okay. So that means if I get my computed style, it's going to work as I expect. And I won't save it to a um, I won't save it to a variable this time. I'll just go ahead and oh Lord, I should save it to a variable. There's so much stuff in there. <laughs> okay, let's clear this and save it to a variable. There we go. Oh, okay. And then I could check the color though, right? And there it shows me my color is red, or I could check the margin top, and it's going to show me that it's set to five pixels. So if I wanted to get the properties that were set for any one thing, I would query from the window object its computed style, and I can actually see what the default CSS values are. So I can't read those directly up the style. I have to query the window object. So that's one of those kind of nuanced things that are worth uh, knowing about. Okay, yeah, so I had to get the computed style. Okay. Uh, so the last things I kind of want to just talk about as it relates to the document object model, because I think we covered all the really important things, like what is a DOM and how is it, how is it modeled inside of memory and how is it modeled inside of JavaScript as, uh, as uh, 
JavaScript objects and how can we traverse the tree or browse the tree? How can we search for something in particular? How can we add or remove uh, uh, items? How can we mutate the state of an HTML node? Uh, we've learned a lot. Then we've seen how we could do the same thing to our styles. So the last thing I want to talk about is how we can use the DOM to find information or mutate information about the element sizes and the scrolling information. And so here, I don't want to spend too much time. It's just worth knowing, but uh, we'll probably won't be touching this a whole uh, um, too much uh, in, in this course, at least. So one thing you should just know is that uh, given a sample element here, how element size and scrolling would be defined in terms of uh, the properties. So suppose we have this div tag with the idea example and it has some text in there. And we have some style that we would use to apply a certain width to that div tag, a certain height, some border size, some padding, uh, whether uh, here we just have overflow set on there as well, uh, which doesn't really matter for this particular illustration for size. But here you could see, given the element, the element would be here. And then the, all the CSS you can see would be defined with your padding, your border, um, your padding on the left and right, your top and bottom, your scroll bar, right? That consumes some rendering space in the viewport. Okay, so this we're pretty familiar with when I think we were looking at the HTML stuff. And so in terms of the geometry or the positions of where your elements might be, you will have these attributes that you have access to inside of your JavaScript object. So like offset left would represent this space between the element and where it actually gets rendered to. And this like client top and client left are gonna represent here, if you look at that, there's gonna be like that, 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 that border space. So you can compare this visualization here to this visualization here to see how you can find the information of where the position information is here and actually access that from JavaScript based off of these properties. So I inserted this as a reference later on if for any reason you need to be able to change the position or get the position of elements. But again, it's not worth delving too much into. So quick summary, and I, I listed all these, these attributes. So I just want to highlight the fact that all this information is included as Part of the HTML elements uh, that these are our our, our our data that that's tracked the position data is tracked on where they appear in the viewport and you can access and mutate this uh, at well. So for any reason in your one of your projects you have that need, this slide is for you. Uh, and then I kind of want to talk about about the window sizes as well. So how do we find the width and the height of the browser window? How do we get the full width and height of the document, including the scrolled out, scrolled out part? And how do we scroll the page using JavaScript? So uh, to get the window width and height, we can use the client width and client height. And so here, why don't we try that? Uh, let's refresh this. Um, let's see, I'm gonna have a body initially. Uh, I lose it when I write. I, when I write to the HTML file, I overwrite everything that was there before. And if I don't give it a body, it won't have a body. Okay, so I have that body. So let's do document dot body dot um to uh I could do my client width, right? There we go. I could do my client height. There we go. So this is going to give me the width and the height. I could get the client top. There we go. And I get my uh, client left. So essentially, all of our viewports, or you could think of as being box shaped, which means the critical information you need is going to be the top left position. So my position here is zero, zero, and then the width and the height. And then you can calculate the, the, the rest of your rectangle. Oh, yeah, and that's exactly so. To get the, the window width and height, we can use client width, client height, and the client top and the client left. Okay. So 
let's talk about coordinates because if we're going to talk about positions that's what it's worth so a lot of times and really the reason why this is going to be relevant is to be able to capture uh mouse events when mouse events uh go ahead and trigger and we'll talk more about this when we get into the event driven or the event uh uh lectures they're going to return back a client x and a client y so the client x and client y it's going to represent a position inside of the document object where a like click event or where some kind of mouse interaction uh, had been triggered so that we can use that to to make interactive uh, mouse uh, mouse responses. OK, so to give an example of this, um, our page X and our page Y, our client X and our client Y are two different um, coordinate spaces. So the page Y and page X are relative to the document, whereas the client X and client Y is relative to our window view. So if in this example, the entire document fits inside of my window, then the page X and page Y is gonna be equal to the client X and the client Y. However, if I have a page that's larger than it can fit in my window and I can scroll up or down my page, then the page X and the page Y can be different than the client X and the client Y. The client X and client Y is relative to the window, the coordinates inside of the window, the viewport as we're seeing it, well, not the viewport, but, uh, uh, but uh, what's actually on screen. Whereas the page X and the page Y is going to be coordinates relative towards the entire contents of the HTML document, what you can see and not see. Does that make sense? that distinction between page X, page Y, and client X and client uh, Y? Excellent. Okay. And so, again, this will be most relevant when we start playing around with some kind of mouse interactions, because when you do mouse interactions, it's predicated on being able to grab, grab coordinates from your DOM. So it's, it's just important to know how these coordinates are generated and what the names are. Typically, you use client X and client Y because you care about the coordinates generated what's inside the viewports window and not necessarily the, uh, the, uh, the entire document. And as I said before, everything is usually modeled as rectangles inside the viewport. So you can, you can compute anything. You get the bounding box of any kind of uh, client rectangle based off of the XY position, which is the top left-hand corner. And then you have a width and you have a height. So, so for instance, you can calculate the right using the left, the left, uh, co uh, the, the X coordinate, which is here and the width that gives you that, or you can get the bottom by using the Y coordinate and the height. Let's see here. Can I? So let's play around with this. Let's see if I can't get. Um... So let's go back to document. Dot uh, body. Dot. Um... What can I grab here? Really describe. I get the coordinates. Might have to call. Okay. So let's do this. Um... So let's try to get the element from a certain point. So let's pass that in a point. So let's do document dot get. Oh, no, it's element from point. Element from point, and let's say I do point zero point zero. It's going to give me the root document there. Let's say I do like. See, so I can I can get uh, once I, I get any position, I can go ahead and query my DOM and say, give me the element that's at these coordinates. Again, super useful from grabbing those coordinates originally from like a mouse click, because then I can mutate the thing that I just uh, I just uh, clicked on. So this again allows me to be able to have user input select something that's on the screen and be able to do something cool with it uh, to change the state of it because then I can grab that ID 
Okay, so I'll describe me the element just now, and then I could change like the inner HTML of that element or change the color of that element. So again, that's the value of knowing how to uh, use these. I can grab the, uh, from the document, I can grab the element at a certain point. I would usually get these points from some event triggered by the mouse, and then I can mutate that element that I get back. Excellent. And that is that is all I have to really talk about with the document object model. Let me see. Yeah, there was actually one other thing. I think that there. Um, Thirty thoughts from point. Uh, um, from point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Get bounding. Right, let's try this one last thing. I think I'll get. There we go. And just so you could see, I can grab the that data on any element by getting its bounding client um, rectangle. So here, I was able to get the X, I was able to get the Y as 8.8, eight. I was able to get that width, 77 and 9.30. So it would also give me the top, it would give me the left, it gives me the right. Uh, and yeah, X, Y, width, and the bottom. So it actually computes the bottom, the left, the right, and the top for me, in addition to giving the X, the Y, the height, and the width. But we could always compute the bottom, height, left, and right ourselves. But this just generates all of those for us. Excellent. So I just want to, to, to pair these together, the idea that I, for any element, I can actually get its positional data, or given some positional data, Given some positional data, I can get back the element. So I can translate between coordinate space to the element of the tree or the element of the tree to its coordinate space. Again, super, super important if you're doing any kind of touch or mouse interaction. OK, so that is everything with the document object model. We are done talking about the API that allows us to interface with and mutate the document. So when we start doing things related to like React, you'll understand what React is kind of doing. Uh, uh, in the background to allow us to uh, to to change the state or what the, some of the concepts behind that. So, is there any questions related to the DOM? And again, you'll have a chance to play around with these in the in this lab that uh, is currently out, the number guessing lab. Maybe not with all these features, though. If if you come across one of your own project designs and you need uh, more uh, accessibility. That's what these um, these uh, lectures really designed for is to be able to give you more information than what we can cram into implementations of labs, just to give you the full scope of what you could potentially do uh, with this API. Excellent. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about then is I want to start talking about event handling. So typically these pair really well. When we talk about the document object model, uh, the reason why we want to interface with the document object model is to be able to update it in response to the user. Uh, and, okay. So, for the uh, for events, I want to talk about a couple of different concepts. I want to talk about um, the event loop. I want to talk about the different types of events that exist. I want to talk about what listeners are and handlers are. Uh, I want to talk about the event object. I want to talk about what it means to uh, have bubbling and capturing in an event-driven system and how we can delegate our events. And then we'll look at a couple of different actual event types uh, in particular. Uh, in, I, I'd like to look at mouse events, keyboard events, touch events, uh, document events, the form and input events, and the time events. And then also uh, how we can define our own custom events and we can deploy those events we can into the event system and have them get handled. So we can actually trigger, dispatch them ourselves. So yeah, oh, so that's a good question. So events 
are very much still part of the front end. So the remaining portions of the um, of lectures that are really going to highlight front end is the uh, event, uh, the event system architecture. So how many people here are kind of familiar with event driven systems? And I kind of I don't know if I want to I want to save some of this commentary for next lecture since I have about nine minutes left and it might be nice to have all this content saved into one video. So let me do this before I talk too much more about events. Now that I've given a, a, a taste of events is let me talk a little bit more about what we're going to do with the front end and maybe that'll be a good like kind of set of topics to talk about at the end of a lecture as opposed to introducing a whole new concept. I'm trying to keep the videos as easily uh, viewable as possible. And I don't know if that's a, a good concept for these lectures or not, but since I'm recording it, it seems like a good motivation to have. So with front end, uh, in my opinion, and again, this approach to this advanced web applications course is uh, very much an opinionated approach from my perspective. But I think in order for you to be adequate at front end development, you need to have an understanding of what a web client is, especially a web client in the form of a web browser, because that is the uh, most used web client that exists. Uh, web uh, uh, web uh, browsers are HTML parsers or HTML viewers. So we have to know what HTML is. We all have to know what HTTP is, which is typically the protocol that gets documents into our web browser, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later when we get into starting to serve files uh, from locations other than our local um, storage from our local uh, host. It's important to know what CSS is, since that's how we will apply styles to our HTML content. It's important to know what JavaScript is, since that is the programming language that runs inside of all web browsers. Uh, it's important to know what the document object model is because that's the set of APIs that are made available inside of the browser to mutate the state of the HTML. The HTML really represents what gets rendered inside of the browser's viewport. And then it's important to understand all the intricacies of JavaScript. So. Uh, not just the basics, like being able to just declare variables or declare selection statements or repetition statements or to declare functions or to declare data structures like arrays or stacks or queues or sets or uh, dictionaries or maps uh, or objects to know how to use JavaScript in a way that you can produce code at an imperative level, at a procedural level at an object-oriented level, at a functional level, uh, being able to use the Lambda functions, uh, which are those really powerful, which, which for us typically represent themselves as those really powerful array processing functions that we learned about in our data structures uh, lecture. Um, but on top of that, you have to know how our user interactions, how our events dispatched in the browser. So the browser is a GUI application. Uh, probably in terms of development, I would say that most of you are probably most familiar developing uh, command-driven software, right? Like all of Java 1, probably most of Java 2 uh, is really revolves around building, building software that, that prompts you for some some command and then executes off that command. Am I am I right with that? Is most of this the the applications that that you have designed predominantly command driven and not uh, event driven? Now, has everyone done an event driven application before in Java two? Isn't there? Did everyone use um, uh, Java to build out some kind of GUI app? Lord. Yeah, so one of my biggest complaints about uh, probably Java as an introductory language is that um, its uh, swing 
using swing to generate GUIs is a very painful endeavor, especially if it's your first time trying to build a graphic user interface. Uh, and one of the advantages we have with JavaScript was that was the original purpose of JavaScript. JavaScript started as a, uh, as a specific domain language, ex especially designed to handle updating the viewport of a browser. And so for that reason, learning how to start doing GUI interfaces, how to do graphics-based event-driven uh, interfaces is done very painlessly, as painlessly as possible. So where you have to set up like a J frame and add a J panel and add a J button and then set up your, uh, your listeners in Java, it is much, much easier to see these concepts in JavaScript. And that's what we're gonna be talking about uh, for our next lecture. And so it's important to understand the distinction then between command-driven systems and uh, uh, in like a text user interface and event-driven systems that you would have in a graphic user interface. And uh, actually, understanding this distinction will uh, give you more insight as to why we typically avoid IDEs for the intro sequence, and we start teaching you how to um, how to start accessing uh, systems and folders and files from your terminal, from your command line interface, from Java One. So. In order for any graphical user uh, interface to work, there's there, there, there's a uh, there's typically an event loop. There's a an event system that that has to exist. And so what happens is, if you have a button that's being rendered inside of your GUI, inside your graphic user interface, and if the if the user clicks on the button. By clicking on the button, an event gets triggered. And so if that event, if there is some, if there's some event handler that is registered to the event loop that triggered the event, that event, event will will call will get handled uh, by by whatever the callback function is. So suppose that you have a click event on the button. So when the user clicks on the button, it generates a click event, which then the system says, oh, when this click event happens on this particular button, I'm supposed to cr call this particular function that might be called uh, create player. And so it causes the application to do something. Actually, we get to see this inside the number guessing game. So the number guessing game uses a event driven system right we generate buttons inside the viewport we have to add listeners to those buttons that will cause our code base our model to do something typically when you start building out a uh, a gui interface there's logic that has to exist that gets input and output from your model to the viewport and uh, to and from the viewport. So there's a way that, or not even from the viewport, it could, there's an input mechanism and an output mechanism. So let's actually talk about something even more complicated. Let's talk about something like a video game system. Let's talk about something like a Nintendo game system. There's your, your input would actually be from a controller. So it's not from the viewport at all. It would be from some external device. And so, so the controller code would just be looking and listening for events generated from the controller. And when that event occurs, it would trigger some action inside of our game model. So our game model, our model is agnostic to the controller logic because we want to hop swap between the controller logic. Maybe we have a controller at one point, but we also want to support like mouse uh, input or, or like keyboard input or touch input. So the idea of separating or or untangling your code that gets user input and sends it to the model versus just having your actions defined in the model is so that we can hot swap where the inputs are coming from without having to refactor our code base inside of our game. And it's the same thing for our viewport. Our viewport will take whatever the game state is and it manages how is it going to display. It's gonna change the state of the display logic. 
So do we want to display it as graphics, as uh, a set of images? Do we want to display it as text? Do we want to represent it in like a 3D uh, 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 realm? And so that's, that's very much a part of, um, of what we need to do for front end development, right? Like user interactions are going to be triggered based off of events. And if we're designing something that's designed, if, if it has to be interacted with, it has to capture the user events, we have to know how these event driven system, systems work. So in this class, every, every uh, piece of software we're going to uh, generate is going to be GUI based, it's going to be event driven which is very unlike what we've done in Java 1 and Java 2. In fact, it looks like what you might have avoided trying to do in Java 1 and Java 2. So here we're going to uh, uh, embrace event-driven coding and, uh, and having GUI interfaces, which is really, it's really the state of modern software. Very few, uh, very small amounts of software are released designed with command-driven systems. And if they are, it's not, it's typically geared more towards developers or people who are comfortable in co command line environments as opposed to general users. Uh, most general users at this point have been highly trained on using uh, GUIs as opposed to TUIs or CLIs, depending on the term you want to use for that. Uh, so, yeah, so. Uh, we have to, so events are definitely going to be something we talk about in terms of something that gets generated by like a touch or keyboard or uh, by, a, by a keyboard click or by some other action that we will have to handle inside of our front end code to cause something to respond. And, and then after that, we will talk about asynchronous JavaScript where we can start making calls to backend web servers from our web client. And once we talk, start talking about asynchronous JavaScript and we start making calls to the backend services, we will be done with uh, client side, with front end development. We can then, we will have such a complete, I think, understanding of web clients that we can then move to web servers and understand how we can build web servers that support web clients, that, that listen to requests from a web client and responds back with the data that it needs to be able to do its job of rendering uh, a part of a web application into a browser's viewport. D does that kind of explain where we're going with the front end uh, portion of this? So really, we just have events to talk about, which is the user interaction stuff. And then we have asynchronous JavaScript, which is how we're going to send requests to a web server. And then we'll take a little bit of look at React, which will be a, um, a HTML, I'm sorry, a JavaScript library that can generate uh, HTML components for us, essentially JavaScript components that can render into HTML components for us. And then, then we will move to Node and start actually looking at a JavaScript runtime environment that runs directly on our OS, which means we can use it to host as a web server for us. And then we'll start building out our own web server uh, services or web servers um, using JavaScript. Excellent. Does, did that answer your question? In terms of not only is this still considered front end, but what the scope of front end will be for this class and when I feel like we'll be ready to migrate to back end. We're really close to being able to migrate to back end. So probably, let's see, uh, I'll, I'll be able to finish events next lecture. So we'll move into asynchronous JavaScript next week. So probably by the end of next week, we will uh, be in a position to start talking about back end services. So probably not next week, but the week after, we should be com we'll, we'll be done with front end. Excellent. Well, with that said, uh, I think I'm out of time. So if there's no other questions, I guess I can, I can end today's recording here. Excellent. So is it, 